Thank you for joining me today on our Side by Side as I bring to a conclusion the story of Helen of the Glen, one of those stories of persecution. And then I will plan to start another one, which will last for the two days to the end of this week. <coughs> Just to mention to you, I think a few some time ago I asked if you would pray for Brian. Brian had terminal cancer. Brian passed away on Sunday. And uh, he... Uh, leaves his wife and children, and I just ask you to pray for his wife, Jackie, and his family. Uh, They've been so faithful, and God has been so real through this whole story, and he's been teaching all of us who have known them uh, many things about his goodness and his grace, and so if we can remember them, that would be tremendous. Let me now take us back to Helen. Today I want to conclude this story, which really is about William, her brother, more than Helen, but she fits back into the story a little. After three years in in Glasgow, William decides it's time to go home. Going home, of course, is walking, and that means walking through the countryside. William had proceeded through the gullies and the moor streams, a few miles only when a storm overtook him. It was sudden and furious, and the snow descended so quickly and closely that he couldn't see his way ahead. It's as though that every wind seemed to contrive about him so that it was a whirl, a blinding. Though young and vigorous, he struggled for a while against the fierceness of it, but every moment he was in danger of falling into some bog. And so the only way he knew to find safety was to stay still. The tempest grew still more violent, and he began to fear for his life. No hope of assistance or of outliving the storm where he was appeared. Nothing was heard on the waste but the roaring of the wind and the driving snow that beat against him and the blinding his eyes, threatening to smother him outright. It was at that point that William remembered things from the past. Sundays, forgotten how his Bible had been neglected and prayer, and his conscience began to awaken within him as the storm increased without. The kind instructions of Helen began to come back, and he said to himself, I don't think I'll ever see her again. But in his heart he cried out a prayer of a sort, Lord, deliver me, and I'll not forget these things, I'll not neglect again. And it was struggling against such a storm and the fears of death, even though he was young, that he shrunk down to the ground, numb and helpless and hopeless. The storm had now somewhat abated, but the darkness of night was now spreading over the mirror, and he was unable to rise or stir himself, and he could feel the frost piercing and attacking his extremities. Another hour, perhaps, and his life would be at an end. A shepherd's dog approached him, looked earnestly in his face, and immediately ran off. William tried to speak to it, but his tongue refused to act. The dog found its master and brought him to where William lay. The shepherd raised him up and took out a little bottle of milk which he carried for his own refreshment. And this succeeded in restoring him to some form of life. The kind soul put his cloak around William's shoulders and carried him uh, to his master's house, which was a lonely hut situated on the midst of the moor, about a mile from where he had fallen. The old man of the house, who had often fled before the cruel and the violent soldiers, like an early Christian, washed William's feet with his own hands. One of his daughters wiped the snow from his clothes and hair. Another made him something to eat, and the mother warmed blankets before the fire for him. The old man was thankful to God for making his servant and his house the means of saving another person. And William went to bed, fell asleep, remembering the shepherd's dog more than the providence of God that had sent it to deliver him. In the morning, he was woken by the deep groaning of someone else in the same room. And the old man, who was knitting socks by the fire, came to his bedside and said, Don't be alarmed. It's only an old soldier who lies there. He was brought in here a few days ago. He was seized with a violent fever, and I don't think he's going to live for many more hours. The name of the man is Rathburn, well-known in the time of persecution for his inflexible cruelty, especially for his cold-blooded murder of the widow of Clyhead. At the name of Rathburn and the widow of Clyhead, 
William started, his face changed colour. What's wrong? said the old man. The soldier can't hurt you now. No, the widow of Clyhead was my mother, and I never hear the name of her murder without it causing me to tremble. Although the reader already knows something of this man, it's necessary just to make a little pause to explain what had happened. You see, during the reign of Charles II, those who served him became like him, accustomed to plunder and massacre and chasing, hounding down God's people at, the, at their own pleasure. They lost every habit of temperance and every feeling of humanity. The consequence was that when disease or old age disabled them for service and deprived them of the means, they were reduced to poverty and hundreds of them forgotten by their masters who they'd served, wandered about after this persecution, begging for bread among the very people whose lives they had pursued. And that's exactly what Rathburn's story was. There was hardly a family in the Murray's districts of the shires of Lanark and Eyre that could not bear witness against him for some act of torture or insolent violence. Now he was disabled because his sword arm had been wounded and damaged. He was old, he had disease, and he had been begging bread for several years. He had been found overcome with hunger and fatigue in the midst of the moors by the same shepherd who saved William, and now he lay fevered on the brink of death, as the old man described him. And the old man would have come alongside him when he was in one of those feverish moments, calling out and shouting about his past. And he would say to him, you know, God's mercy is infinite. He would try to comfort him. He would try to show him that God's kindness was greater than his wickedness. He reminded him that the Lord is slow to anger and he is abundant in mercy. And he says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be like white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be like wool. But no, Rathburn could not bear with such a message. He says, I never prayed and God will never hear me now. The gates of heaven are shut against me. It was after some tossings and turnings that the man, Rathburn, cried out a deep groan. His body shook and it lay still forever. And his soul was summoned to a place where there is no appeal. That first death had a great impact upon William. But the other death that had a big impact upon William was the death of his sister. His sister, she became ill so ill that there was no hope for her. And in her time of sickness, she was able to appeal to William, who had somehow lost his way. And he had begun to have a, an outward desire to return to the faith that he had as a child, but it hadn't yet happened to him in his heart. And the sinful habits which he acquired, they were very strong and they were not easily broken away. And while his companions, they prevailed upon him with all sorts of persuasions, he found it very hard to resist them. But during this time, when William had been brought face to face with both the, the terrible and frightening experience of a man who faces death without Christ, and the wonderful peacefulness of his sister who faced death with Christ, he was able to turn his heart to the Lord and trust him once again. He discovered that the weakness of his own resolutions was no match for the power of the world around him. And he had to learn to distrust himself and he had to go humbly and fervently to trust God and pray. He knew that none of his friends would stand with him in the time of death or shield him from the fear of its terrors. And above all, now that he had tasted something of how God was so kind, he was not going to abandon that. And so with the love of God warming his heart and the light of his wisdom giving him understanding, and the power of his grace being exerted on his will, he now felt the meaning of that saying, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. He was able to set apart himself from the praise of other people and be delivered from it. He had withdrawn from dependence on his own strength, which is weakness, and he lost the honour of wicked men, which is a disgrace, and he gave up many things that were idols in his life. And he rested himself in the goodness of God, in the business or in business life, William was prosperous, shedding all his 
activities with a worldliness that he had before, and the holy influence of a godly life was around him. During his whole life, he was particularly careful of the young men who came in from the country like himself. He never married, and every summer, as long as he lived, he visited the graves of his mother and his sister, stayed a week or two with the shepherd boy, the son of the farmer, who it was that had carried him in the midst of the storm. And in his very last, he himself was carried to his grave like a shock of corn that was fully ripe.